Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, actually, I came here to see who was brave enough to be here in the room and not outside on the beach. And I have to say, I'm delighted. So uh, indeed, today, I'm, uh, I'm here to talk about, about change and uh, the way I aspire to embrace it and help others around embrace it. So you've all read the, uh, I, I presume, the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. Uh, you've read uh, uh, stories about what's happening and the 1.5 degree uh, target, uh, uh, the emission cut that we need to make to avoid some catastrophic uh, climate impact. But in fact, I could have picked any other foreseeable change. In this movie, Don't Look Up, it's about the comet, right? It's about something that we know is happening. It's in front of us. Science tells us it's here. Change is coming. And yet, we're so comfortable in our habits, we do nothing. And that is what I really want to talk about today. Uh, to almost 20 years ago, President Jacques Chirac made a speech even saying, the house is on fire, and yet we look the other way. And, and the question is, why is that? Why is that that we, we cannot act, we cannot change? When I think about... Uh, my children, my two kids, they are 10, they live in California. And uh, almost now every summer we see the fires, we see the smoke. I remember last summer the sky being red for weeks. And they asked me, Dad, is it going to happen uh, always? Is it going to stop at some point? And what I tell them and at what I try to teach them is, well, this is part of the change that is happening around us. And you need to build this muscle of resilience and adaptation. And this is really uh, the point. Take another example. Take the COVID, right? Uh, I remember distinctly in uh, November 2019, sitting in the executive committee of our group, where um, the second uh, company in France with the most international presence after Air France. We are present in 140 countries, and my colleagues from China at the time were already experiencing the first lockdowns. And if you remember, uh, China was even building field hospitals with 5,000 uh, beds. And we were here uh, sitting in Europe looking at it like it's some kind of foreign problem. It will never uh, reach us. Even the authorities were telling us, we don't need masks. Uh, we don't need to, to worry. You know, this will not happen. This will not come to us. Yet, this was a change right in front of us. So some companies, like ours, uh, took some measures. We actually did order 300,000 masks back in December. And I remember myself in December, before there was even uh, cases in France, making sure that all our teams had laptops and had the ability to uh, work from home because we knew something was coming. But why is it that it was so rare? And in fact, we ended up with everybody rushing to get those masks and even, in some cases, toilet paper. Remember the shortage in the, in the supermarkets, right? So this is changed in front of us, a couple months away, yet we do nothing. Well, in fact, this is because the human brain can only process linear thinking. We have a very hard time processing exponential thinking. We see things in front of us. We have to see the consequences emerging, being uh, able to feel that we will be touched by this in a uh, short amount of time to react, hence the toilet paper. But if we tell you, look, in a year, two years, let alone in the case of climate change, 10 years, 20 years, something will happen, it is much harder to process and change your ways of working, your ways of living, because it's just too hard. And so this is the muscle I try to build in my kids. This is the muscle I try to build in my company and in myself to adapt and to anticipate. In fact, one last anecdote on the COVID. This model, that was uh, uh, now the, the, the reality, I received uh, mid-December 2019 a model that was predicting the first wave, the second wave, and the third wave in France with almost only three weeks accuracy. So it was so precise because it is math, it is stats, in fact, some parameters, and you can anticipate that we knew already there would be several lockdowns and several waves. And yet, what did we do, right? So this is the muscle. That's, uh, that's uh, as a leader, uh, as a father, as a person, I'm trying to, uh, to help build. Because we know, uh, in fact, that there are solutions. Take climate change. If you look at uh, a recent McKinsey study, what, uh, what they explain quite clearly and factually is that for the target of CO2 reduction we need to achieve, 50% of it can be made with existing technologies that are at scale. 
You know, we, we know how to do nuclear, we know how to do uh, uh, wind farms, we know how to do uh, solar panels. This is all existing. It's about scaling up. 25% uh, are technologies that are uh, proven way past R&D, but can be uh, scaled up. Uh, hydrogen is a great example. It would take uh, a clear investment plan, uh, projects, countries, and we know how to build the uh, uh, sufficient uh, quantities for hydrogen in terms of production, storage, and distribution to achieve uh, what we expect in terms of CO2 reduction. And of the 25% that are left, uh, almost, uh, and this is for cap carbon capture, uh, those technologies, even though they are still in R&D, they also can be developed and scaled up. Think about the Microsoft plan. Microsoft has committed that they will be carbon neutral and even carbon negative by 2030. It means they will absorb more CO2. I'm not saying compensate, I'm saying absorb from the atmosphere more carbon than they emit. So technology is there. It's just a matter of let's do it. However, there's a problem of money. The hydrogen component alone would require $700 billion to achieve its uh, uh, necessary scale for the, the, the overall uh, CO2 uh, abatement, right? So there's a problem of money, but mostly it's a problem of change. Problem of change because here it's India and I could have picked anywhere else. Uh, the human on average to stay in the 1.5% needs to emit two tons of CO2 per year. In India, more than a billion people were close already to 1.618. Do you see yourself convincing people, every one of them, to stay where they are and not aspire for themselves and their kids to consume more, to live better? Um, think about uh, the US. Uh, we are way past two tons, but how to do? Because uh, you go to a BMW dealership in the US, the, you, you cannot even find, you cannot even order the small engines that you see here in Europe. They are not on sale over there. So uh, it's not even about convincing people. It's just the, the, the magnitude of that change is significant. And I could go on and on with examples. So the point here is when you think about the common thread is when we are convinced about climate change, we are convinced we need to do something. The thread is, in fact, we want other people to change. And this is hard. So on top of conviction, on top of doing everything we can ourselves and others, we also need to be ready for change. We need to embrace change because it will happen to us no matter what we do. No matter what we do, governments, presidents, here is an example, there are many others, have a duty to uh, enhance the GDP of their population. And think about this guy, uh, you have tons of resources in your country, you could uh, harvest them, you could develop economic growth, or you could preserve the Amazon, right? It's hard to choose. You have elections coming up, and this situation happens in many countries. It happens in the US, it happens here in Europe, it's actually next weekend in France. So it is very hard to go against all those powers. So you, yourself, need to embrace change and be ready for it. Especially if you listen to this guy. You know who it is? It's uh, Jean-Marc Jancovici, the French um, scientist and, uh, and, uh, and consultant who uh, does a lot of fact-based modeling of the impact of climate change. And what I find the most scary and also the most real is this. It is the map of the deadly heat days in the world. So it means on those countries, right, around the equator, there will be days where if you're there and if you don't have air conditioning, basically you die. And why is that? Because humidity. The human body, as you know, you were here in Nice, uh, when it's nice and warm in the summer, couple degrees, five, 10 degrees, we sweat. And the, the fact that the air is relatively dry makes us uh, able to cool our body down. But if it's very humid, when you sweat, you don't cool your body down. And in those countries, in this area, uh, obviously, air conditioning is not accessible to everyone. And even air conditioning emits CO2 because it requires power. So what will happen when you have those days of uh, deadly heat? Obviously, people will move, right? They will go south or north. And this will, of course, bring massive change to them, to billions of people, and massive change to the people in the white area, right? North and south. Because 
simply there will be uh, new needs for food, for supply chain, for housing. Um, change is just coming. There's no way around it. So what can we do? And this is really the purpose of my speech. I'll start with me personally. I have built on purpose for the last, as long as I remember, maybe 30 years, the muscle for change. For example, I don't own any physical asset. This suit is probably my most expensive physical possession. I have no house, I have no car, I have no watches, I have no art. I only have immaterial assets. I move house once a year. I have been moving house once a year in the last 20 years. Me, my kids, we move all the time. I have changed careers. I have started uh, with 10 years with McKinsey, very happy as a consultant. And when I started to know the ropes, then I decided to go in high tech, changing friends, changing network, changing expertise. And uh, when you come uh, fresh, obviously, you know nothing, but you learn, right? And that's, uh, that's uh, intellectually fascinating, unsettling, but exciting. And then after 10 years in tech, then I decided to go to uh, a 200 year old company doing professional services. And as a leader on top of that, so imagine uh, my surprise. I knew nothing, I had no network, I had no customer, I had no legitimacy, but I loved the thrill of the change. And think about geographies. I started in Singapore, then moved to the US in Boston for a couple of years. Then I moved to France, then I moved to San Francisco, then I moved back to Paris. Every single time changing friends, clients, house, restaurants even. And this change, this habit of change is a muscle that you grow over time. It's not something you're born with, it's something you develop. Now, as a CEO, as a leader of uh, uh, more than 12,000 people, I have also a duty to help them embrace the change, build this muscle. And for that, there are many things that uh, I am doing. First of all, um, I encourage risk taking. F risk is good, failing is not a problem. What is a problem is if you stay in your ways. I always help them challenge the way things have been done in a company for sometimes 20, 30 or more years. The way we work, the way our back office operates, the way our IT systems are designed around old legacy processes. It's my job to challenge that and say, why is that? And, uh, and what I love the most is when my team makes ideas to break something, just try to innovate and improve something. This is my job as a boss. It's also my job to help them change with new talent. And I love this audience because new talent is also a huge vector of change for organization. This is an example in, uh, in Kenya. In Kenya, we're working with an incubator called uh, Ada Labs. Those are kids, basically, who have learned from zero the uh, most innovative technologies. We're talking way beyond uh, code and Ruby and all that. We're talking uh, artificial intelligence. We're talking data science. We're talking uh, uh, augmented reality. We are talking about drone computing and programming. And those kids who have no professional experience, I inject them inside the business. And of course, it challenges the existing team to change. That is why I'm doing that for those kids, but also for the team. Then I have duty with my clients because all my clients nowadays have questions about climate change. What can we do to reduce our CO2? Uh, how do we change our production process, etc.? That is fine, and that's what we consult them on. However, we have built also an approach with this company, Carbon4, which is about adapting to the upcoming change. Resilience. You're a customer, and maybe your factory will be flooded regularly. You operate nuclear power plants. Well, how would they run when the temperature is higher and there's less water? You have a supply chain that goes through uh, some uh, areas of the world that, were on, that are on the red map that I showed you earlier. Well, what do you need to change in your supply chain and in your supply environment? Right? So this is how we help our clients challenge their ways and prepare for change. Then, as, a, as an organization, a company, uh, I remember distinctly at Salesforce, something that struck me is the constant change. Every six months, there would be a reorg. Sometimes you would change a boss and then go back to the previous boss, all that within a year. 
you say, why would they do that? And they do this only to train this change muscle. So you're not used in your ways, you're used to change. And this is extremely important in tech, when things move so fast, you, uh, you learn a language, and by the time you're on the job market, the language you learn at school is no longer the cool language and it's something else. It's all about changing constantly yourself. This applies to your life, this applies to your work. Now, what can you do? You may say, where do I start? Um, well, I have, uh, something, a routine that I've, uh, I've done over the years and I encourage you to try. When you're at a restaurant, you look at the menu, you select something yummy that you really want to order, just at the moment where the waiter is here, you throw it through the window and you pick something else. Just that is a small step, but it will build your change muscle. Then, of course, it's about intellectual change. So for the French people among here, we have a, an election in a week. And there's many elections around the world all the time. Well, I encourage you, when you're set in your beliefs, in your ways, in your opinions, to read the opposite press, to listen to opposite speakers with an open mind. Try to change your way and at least pick something that you believe makes sense. So you can understand the other side and you can maybe change a little bit and be ready for that. That is something that uh, trains this muscle. And some of those people here, they've uh, changed themselves. They've demonstrated it's possible to do it from actor to president, from CEO to philanthropist. This is because they've built this muscle of change that is so fundamental nowadays uh, in everybody's life. Now, with this, I hope I've convinced you that being outside of your zone of comfort is actually what you need to aspire to. Being uncomfortable in the zone of comfort, craving change, being excited by the evolution of the world around us, not scared, embracing it, and now it's time to do your part. Thank you very much.